On the evening of December 7th, 2000, Trevor Dealey went to his office's Christmas party at a nightclub down the street from the Bank of Ireland in Dublin, where he had been working in the IT department for about a year. Upon leaving the party at 3.30 a.m., Trevor couldn't get a ride back to his apartment due to a massive taxi driver strike, and his only option was to walk home through an area notorious for crime and gang Holy violence. Holy shit! It was a 20-minute walk home, and since the bank was pretty much just up the street, Trevor decided to make a quick stop at his office to grab his umbrella before walking home in the rain. Strangely, the bank's CCTV footage shows a man dressed in black standing behind one of the pillars of the bank's gate. The man can be seen standing there for almost half an hour before Trevor arrives. A little after 3.30, the man in black pulls out his cell phone to take a call, and a few seconds later, Trevor walks by also on the phone. Police later determined that at that exact time, Trevor had made a phone call to a co-worker who was still at the bank. The CCTV video shows Trevor arriving at the bank's front gate, and a second man dressed in black steps out of the shadows to talk to him. Trevor ends his call as he opens the gate and talks to the man in black. It doesn't look like they know each other, but Trevor doesn't seem to be scared or concerned. The man simply stands by the gate as Trevor walks in, and a few minutes later, the man in black walks out of the camera's view. Trevor's co-worker reported that he and Trevor shared a cup of tea that night and talked about the party for a while, and that Trevor had also logged onto his work computer for a couple of minutes just before he left the bank at about 4 a.m. The CCTV footage shows Trevor stepping out onto the street and opening his umbrella before walking home. He didn't appear to be followed, and a few minutes later at about 4.06 a.m., he made a call to a friend to let him know that everything was alright and that he was on his way home, but since his friend was still asleep, he left a voicemail. That voicemail would be the last time that anyone heard from Trevor Dealey. Holy shit! At 4.14 a.m., Trevor was seen walking by an ATM on a street about 15 minutes away from his apartment. Less than 30 seconds later, a man in black appears on screen, apparently following Trevor. 16 years later in 2016, the CCTV footage was digitally enhanced, and police determined that the man in black from the bank was the same man who later followed him. This was the last footage where Trevor was seen alive. Although he missed work on Friday, his co-workers didn't seem to find it strange, considering that many other employees were still hungover from the party and had also taken the day off. But after his friends and family couldn't get in touch with him over the weekend, and he didn't show for work on Monday, he was immediately reported missing. Trevor's friends and family led the search from the beginning, and it was actually his friends and not the police who managed to get the disturbing footage from that evening. Unfortunately, they didn't have access to the footage until four days after his disappearance, which meant that the police had lost valuable time in wait the search minute, for Trevor Wait a minute, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. There may have been- Trevor's friends and family led the search from the beginning, and it was actually his friends and not the police who managed to get the disturbing footage from that evening. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, they didn't have That's access crazy. to the footage until four days after his disappearance, which meant that the police had lost valuable time in the search for Trevor Dealey. There may have been more CCTV footage of Trevor from that night, but at the time, CCTV cameras recorded their footage on VHS tapes, which were often recorded over with new footage, erasing the previous footage in the process. That's insane. Over the years, several theories- That your friends, that his friends and family got more evidence than the fucking police, bro. ...about Trevor's disappearance have surfaced, but none of them have been confirmed. Some have speculated that he might have been intoxicated that night, which may have caused him to fall into the water under the bridge and drown. But Irish police searched all nearby bodies of water, and no signs of Trevor were ever found. Most people believe that the mysterious man who was seen following Trevor in the CCTV footage had something to do with his disappearance, but to this day he remains unidentified. In 2017, police received a tip from an anonymous source who claimed to know what had happened to Trevor. According to this source, the man who followed Trevor that night was a gang member who murdered Trevor after he refused to help him gain access to the Bank of Ireland building. The man supposedly buried him in the woods a few miles away from where Trevor was last seen. For several weeks, 20 police officers and a search dog continued to search the site, but after two months of digging, the search was called off. 23 years after the incident, Trevor Dealey's chilling disappearance is an open and active case. The events leading up to it, however, are still a mystery. That's crazy. On November 28, 2012, Emma Filipoff disappeared under very strange circumstances in Victoria, British Columbia. A year before a mysterious Yo, disappearance, Mahal, thank you for Emma had fulfilled up. her lifelong dream of moving to the Canadian West from Perth, Ontario. Although she arrived in Victoria without a job or place to live, Emma quickly moved in with a friend and found work at a local cafe while she looked for her own place to live. Things seemed to be going well for Emma, but when winter came, she became much more withdrawn and started acting in strange ways. 
According to her roommate, it wasn't uncommon to see Emma engage in obsessive compulsive rituals and erratic behaviors and to fall victim to what seemed to be manic episodes. Just a few what? months after her arrival in Victoria, Emma abruptly left her friend's apartment, quit her job at the cafe, and began living pretty much anywhere she could find. She stayed at a hotel, camped in the woods, and even slept on boats in Victoria's Harbor for a while. By early 2012, Emma was living in a woman's shelter in Victoria. That summer, Emma landed a seasonal job at Redfish Bluefish, a popular seafood restaurant in Victoria's Inner Harbor, where she seemed relatively happy for a while. It was also around that time that Emma bought a red Mazda MPV van in hopes of permanently living on the road and traveling to different cities in the US, Mexico, and Canada. When she left her seasonal job in October, she assured her co-workers that she would be back in the spring. Unfortunately, Emma's mental health struggles kept her from reaching the freedom she longed for, and her behavior grew increasingly erratic and unpredictable. In the months before her disappearance, her friends and some of the staff at the woman's shelter mentioned that she had been acting paranoid over an unnamed man she had dated back when she was a culinary school student in Perth. She never mentioned whether they had kept in touch, but this seemed to be one of the causes for her paranoid behavior. A few weeks before her disappearance, Emma had an episode where she dragged the furniture in the woman's shelter across the street and later claimed that she heard voices coming from the furniture telling her to do it. What the Around fuck? Around that time, she also gave away and sold many of her personal belongings. Heard voices from the couch, bro? On November 20th, Emma was seen on CCTV at the YMCA in Victoria. In this strange video, she can be seen walking in and out of the building several times in the span of 14 minutes. Some people have speculated that she might have been trying to hide from someone, while others claim she was probably waiting for a ride and didn't want to spend the entire time outside in the freezing cold while her ride arrived. But neither of these theories were ever confirmed. Three days after this footage was captured, Emma had a series of emotional conversations over the phone with her mother, during which Emma asked her mother to let her move back in with her in Perth. Her mother agreed, but grew concerned after Emma changed her mind several times between moving back to Perth and staying in Victoria during their conversations. On November 28th, Emma's mother realized she was living in a woman's shelter after she dialed back a number that Emma had called from and a staff member answered the phone. Concerned about her daughter's well-being, she immediately took a plane to Victoria. Early that same day, at around 8.30 a.m., Emma was captured on CCTV walking into a 7-Eleven and buying a prepaid card for $200. Later that afternoon, Dude, she went back to the 7-Eleven to buy a prepaid cell phone, which she never activated. The video shows Emma repeatedly looking out the window and hesitating before leaving the store, as if she was trying to avoid someone on the outside. Her paranoid behavior suggests that she might have been followed or threatened, but this was never confirmed. After finally leaving the 7-Eleven, she arrived back at the shelter at about 6pm to find out that her mother was on her way to pick her up and take her home. Upon hearing the news from a staff member, Emma rushed out the front door and took a cab to the airport. A few minutes later though, Emma cut the ride short by telling the driver she couldn't afford the $60 ride, even though reports mentioned that she had had over $2,000 on her at the time. Dennis Quay, an acquaintance of Emma, later ran into her at a crossing outside the Empress Hotel at around 8 p.m. How do you have that much money in your life? She seemed living extremely in a agitated shelter. and refused to cross the street. Emma's paranoid behavior led Dennis to ask her if she was being followed, but she assured him that she wasn't. Not knowing what else to do, Dennis called the police to tell Dude, them there was wild. a dazed and distressed woman walking barefoot in front of the Empress Hotel. A few minutes later, Victoria police arrived and spoke to Emma for 45 minutes. Somehow, the officers decided that she was not a threat to herself or anyone else, and they let her go. That was the last time anyone ever saw Emma. Three hours after she was last seen, her mother arrived at the woman's shelter to pick her up, but Emma was nowhere to be found. After her mother reported her missing, the search for Emma Filipov began. The following morning, investigators found Emma's red Mazda van in the Chateau Victoria Hotel parking lot, where she had paid to get it towed three days before her disappearance on November 25th. Inside the van were all of Emma's belongings, including her laptop, passports, a pillow, and clothes, indicating that she might have been planning to move back to Perth or run away. Unfortunately, this is where Emma's case went cold, except for a few mysterious tips. In 2014, a man in a green shirt walked into a convenience store in Gastown, about 75 miles north of Victoria. According to the store owner, the man ripped off a poster advertising a $25,000 reward for finding Emma, telling the owner that Emma wasn't missing. He claimed that Emma was his girlfriend and that she had been living with him and that she ran away from her family what because she hated fuck? him. Although the store owner reported this to the police, the man was never identified. Four years later in 2008... 
How do you not identify? Dude, how do you, how? How do you not identify him? 18, almost six years after Emma's disappearance, another man confirmed that he had seen her on the morning after her disappearance, claiming that up until then, he hadn't made the connection that the woman he had seen was Emma. According to the man, Emma was standing on the side of the road, barefoot and soaking wet, looking nervous and paranoid as she asked the man for a ride. She claimed she was going to visit a friend in Colwood, about 10 miles from Victoria. The man told Emma he couldn't take her that far, but he drove her a few miles and dropped her off at a nearby gas station. After that, nobody ever saw Emma again. Strangely, the identity of this friend that Emma mentioned she was going to visit is still a mystery. Although Emma's mother has searched non-stop for her daughter for several years, the cause for Emma's disappearance is still unknown. Some people speculate that she might have fallen victim to the man she mentioned she dated back in Perth, even though the police interrogated him and eventually cleared him. Another possibility is that she was kidnapped by the man in the green shirt in the footage. Due to Emma's mental state in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, other people think that her mental health struggles might have gotten the best of her. 11 years later, and police still don't know whether Emma even left the island in the first place, or if she's still out there somewhere. Dude, that was so fucked up, man. Like, at first I thought she was paranoid, then I started to believe that she had people following her, then I went back to her being paranoid, then I went back to maybe the guy in the green shirt fucking killed her. Dude, I could never do that. I could never, like, bounce back and forth from city to city to city living in my car, dude. I could never do that. When you don't have, like, a good bed or, like, a home, it's fucking miserable, man. It is awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's he touch? Shut the fuck up. The haunting disappearance of the Jameson family in 2009 gained public attention and media coverage after some disturbing footage of the family was found by police. In she 2009, had been on drugs Bobby and Sherilyn Jameson lived with their six-year-old daughter Madison in Eufaula, Oklahoma. Although they lived what appeared to be normal lives, the Jamesons' marriage was a rocky one, and police have long tried to figure out if their difficult circumstances were somehow tied to their disappearance. Around the time of their disappearance, the couple had been dealing with financial issues. Since 2003, the Jamesons had been on disability after Bobby was involved in a serious car accident that left him with severe chronic back pain. His wife, Sherilyn, had her own health issues. She had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but sometimes refused to take her medication. In 2009, the family decided to drive up to check out a 40-acre plot of land in Red Oaks, Oklahoma, about 30 miles away from their home in Eufaula. They specifically asked to inspect the plot of land without a real estate agent present. The Jamesons had That's told their weird. friends and family that they were planning on moving there to start a new life after pulling their six- Why would you want to go to a place without the agent there? He did the pause thing. One less witness. Six-year-old daughter Madison out of kindergarten over some kind of disagreement with their daughter's school. During the week they drove up to Red Oaks, nobody heard from the family. Because they were an unusually private family that often went off the grid without contacting anybody for weeks at a time, nobody assumed that the Jamesons had disappeared. But after a pair of hunters discovered the family's truck abandoned on a dirt road at the edge of the woods nine days after they were last seen, it was clear that something was wrong. Inside the truck, police found a GPS, cell phones, empty pill bottles, wallets, and $32,000 in cash, what which was extremely fuck? strange considering the Jamesons had been struggling financially. Disturbingly, the Jamesons' dog was found alive in the truck, dehydrated and starving after spending days in the locked vehicle. Oh no! Police also reported that they found a chilling 11-page angry letter from Sherilyn to Bobby, in which she accused him of hating his daughter and being a loner and a hermit. According to a specific police report, there was a haunting sentence in the letter that read, I would not wish my daughter to be raised in foster care because of you being in prison for attempted murder and her mother dead. At this point, it was impossible for anyone to know what had happened to the Jamesons. Holy shit. But immediately after it was determined that the family was missing, police started a search around the area where the truck was found. For nine months, a search team consisting of 400 volunteers, 16 search dogs, unmanned drones, planes, horses, and a specialized search unit scoured the woods in search of the missing family. During this time, police found unsettling footage recorded by the family's home security cameras from the day the Jamesons vanished. In the video, Bobby and Sherilyn can be seen loading their truck in preparation for the trip, but something immediately seems off about the footage. The couple make over 20 trips to load the truck, sometimes putting things in the truck and then taking those same things back to the house, then back to the truck again. A few times, the husband and wife even walk from the truck to the house and back again without carrying anything in their hands. Strangely, the couple change clothes several times throughout the video. And it's hard to tell exactly with the low frame rate of the footage, but they seem to not interact with each other a single time. 
The psychologist that was called in to review the footage immediately attributed the couple's bizarre trance-like movements and strange behavior to illegal drug use. Bobby had a history of drug use, but it was never confirmed whether the couple was under the influence of drugs during the video. After looking deeper into the Jamisons' lives, police were only left with more questions. A pastor close to the family mentioned that shortly before their disappearance, Bobby had told him that there were spirits living on the roof of his house, and he had even requested that an exorcism be performed at his home multiple times. Bobby Jameson a also owned a copy ghost? of the Satanic Bible, which he had been reading before his disappearance to try and find a way to make the spirits leave his house. Friends and family members have also mentioned that they believe the house was haunted, and many of them reported having paranormal experiences and feeling an overwhelmingly dark presence whenever they visited the house. Oh, shit. Despite the validity of these claims, it is known that Sherilyn Jameson was involved in a kind of witchcraft. She frequently held seances at her house and often spoke about her supposed paranormal experiences. Sherilyn owned cats, and after they died, she suspected that her neighbors had poisoned them, so she spray-painted the words, Witches do not like it when their cats are killed, on a large metal storage container on the Jameson's property. The mystery around the case continued to grow, Holy but it wasn't fuck. until November 2013, four years after the Jameson's disappearance, that two deer hunters stumbled upon the skeletal remains of two adults and a small child, about three miles from where the family's truck had been found four years earlier. Because the bones were heavily decomposed, it wasn't until eight months later that forensic investigators were finally able to confirm that the skeletons belonged to the Jameson family. Due to the state of the skeletal remains, the cause of death couldn't be determined. With so many disturbing events and unsettling circumstances leading to the family's disappearance, many theories about what had happened to the Jamesons began to surface. Police began by investigating Bobby Jameson's father in connection with the murders. Less than six months before the family's disappearance, Bobby had sued his father for $10,000 for making him work unpaid at his gas station, promising him that he'd give his son a stake in the business in the future. After his father sold the gas station and refused to pay him, Bobby started a lawsuit against his father. But things took a dark turn, and Bobby had to get a restraining order after his father threatened to kill him and his family multiple times. Even though Bobby's father was a known meth user and was involved in criminal activity, police concluded that he was not involved in the family's death. What the fuck? One popular theory is that, considering Bobby Jameson's drug use and the unexplained $32,000 found in the family's car, it's possible that the Jamesons were involved in the drug trade and were killed in a drug deal gone wrong. The area where the bodies were found in is notorious for drug activity, but no solid evidence has been found to support this theory. Police found a small hole on the back of Bobby's head, but forensic experts believe that it was too small to be a bullet hole and that it was most likely caused by animals after his death. Other people have speculated that the Jamesons could have been involved in a cold. The strange symbols and cryptic writing that was found on the family's truck seemed to support this idea, and Sherilyn's own mother claimed that her daughter was on a cult's hit list for some unknown reason. Although there has been cold activity in eastern Oklahoma since the 90s, their presence has decreased over the years Bro, this and is it like... was never confirmed whether the Jamesons had any involvement with the cold. Because of the hate letter found in the truck and the couple's history of mental illness and drug use, some people think that either Bobby or Sherilyn could have murdered their family before themselves. With no evidence at the scene to support any of these theories, the case has remained unsolved for 14 years. Police and investigators are still searching for new evidence, but there are currently no suspects for the disappearance and murder of the Jameson family. Dude, that story was even crazier than the last one. It was like someone had like a dartboard and on the dartboard were just random crazy shit. Ghosts, aliens, drug trafficking, lawsuit. And you just threw the dart and you just hit random targets. And then you put all that shit into a story. On the evening of Wednesday, July 29, 2015, Stephen Mackerel went out with his brother and some friends to Lucky's Tavern, a popular bar in downtown Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Stephen's brother left the bar at 11 p.m. to go to work the next morning. When he noticed Stephen was intoxicated, he told his brother to go home and drive safely. Dude, these stories but the are night insane. was still young, and at around 1.30 a.m., Stephen and his friends left the bar and agreed to meet in the parking lot of a nearby Walgreens to plan their next move. But Stephen never made it to the Walgreens, and his friends never saw him again. Stephen lived with his parents and worked as a professional poker dealer at a casino in Hollandale Beach near Fort Lauderdale. He didn't come home the next day and didn't show up for work the day after that. His family knew something was wrong. Police reported that there were several surveillance systems in the area where Stephen was last seen. 
but they said it might take weeks before they could gather the relevant hey, Kerry, footage. thank you for the resub. In the meantime, investigators interviewed the friends and family thank members who had last seen Steven. Thinking that he might have gotten into an accident due to his intoxicated state, police conducted searches in many different lakes and ponds, but nothing important was found. The search became even more complicated when investigators learned that Steven's phone battery had died at the bar. Because the phone was never turned on after that night, it was impossible for police to use the phone to locate Steven. At the time of his disappearance, Steven was 25 and had a one-year-old daughter and a long-term girlfriend he had plans to marry. And his friends and family claimed that he was not the type of person who would voluntarily walk out of his life and just vanish with no explanation. Unfortunately, some of the footage that was found during the investigation suggests that Steven's disappearance was not at all his choice. Two weeks after he was last seen, police discovered that Steven had used his credit card at a gas station in Pompano Beach about an hour after he had left the bar. It was about a 15 mile drive from the bar to the gas station, and nobody understood why Steven had even taken that detour in the first place. The surveillance footage from inside the gas station shows Steven entering the store at 2.26 a.m., appearing to be intoxicated as he stumbles around the store, shopping for snacks. His behavior doesn't seem to bother the store owner, and less than a minute later, he walks to the counter to pay for the snacks with his credit card. For a few minutes after that, Steven had a casual conversation with two young women who were inside the gas station, but this happened out of the camera's view. Nearly a week after the initial footage was revealed, police obtained additional footage of Steven that completely changed the course of the investigation. The CCTV footage shows Steven standing next to his 2013 white Ford Fusion in the parking lot. He seems to get into some sort of altercation with the driver of an unidentified silver sedan, and as the silver car pulls away, Steven takes a step back and throws what appears to be his drink at the driver. He gestures with his hands at the driver as he gets into his vehicle. And three minutes later, the silver car circles back into the gas station, this time pulling right behind Steven's car. The driver's intentions are unknown, but as soon as Steven pulls away in his Ford, the silver sedan speeds oh, after yeah, him. He's this was the last time Steven was seen alive. All police knew about the driver was that he was an African-American man who had walked shirtless into the gas station store a few minutes before the incident, but was never identified. For eight years, Fort Lauderdale- Shirtless? I thought it was no shoes, no shirt, no service. Police have been searching for Steven's car. His license plate was never scanned by any license plate readers, indicating that he never left the Fort Lauderdale area. Search teams have combed through over 20 bodies of water looking for the car, but nothing has ever been found. Disturbingly, during the searches, almost 20 other vehicles have turned up in nearby lakes, ponds, and canals, including stolen vehicles with bullet holes. Holy but nothing fuck. relating to Steven's disappearance. Not even a clue. As of 2023, detectives and investigators still have no idea if Steven was involved in an accident or if he became the victim of something much more sinister. Oh, that was a that was a really good video. That was awesome. This guy's channel is awesome, man. I'm gonna like this.